apologize for that. <laughs> there you go. Welcome, everybody. There we go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Now we are on YouTube. We already said hi to our people in our Zoom, but welcome back uh, to Insider's Guide to the Galaxy. You already actually know everybody now if you were here in last session. Uh, my name is Samantha. You have Chris, and we have Jody, and there's Isaac who just popped in. This episode is part two of our previous one. Um, we have visitors from Lessons from Beyond. And we're well, talking about lessons from beyond. And we're going to continue on from where we were in our last episode two weeks ago. So if you stay, hang out, check out this one. But if you really like this one, we have a whole nother one uh, from last week up on our YouTube channel. Isaac is not. Okay. Um, Isaac doesn't have his video on for people in Zoom. Uh, that's probably why you cannot see him. He's um, coming. It's He's coming. coming on, but don't worry. We're going to start. We're going to I'm switch it up here. this week. So, hi, Isaac. <laughs> um, so we're planning on switching it up. We're going to do messy minutes first, and then we'll have the whole rest of the session to listen to Isaac and Jody and all their knowledge they have to share with us. Also, yeah. So let's yeah let's Chris. let's cover <laughs> let's cover the um the the Messier objects for our Messier minutes for this session. Um, here we are at the point of the lunar month where the moon's out of sight now for the next couple of days, and then it'll rejoin us late in the um, late in the week, where it'll be a pretty crescent moon, maybe with some Earth shine over the western horizon after sunset. So in this interim, we've got uh, still some nice dark skies to take advantage of. So what I recommend is that if you haven't yet grabbed your uh, fainter messiers from the winter, so say the Crab Nebula, Orion Nebula, um, M42, M43, Crab Nebula M1, and also the um, uh, M70, where's my M78, the Casper the Friendly Ghost, you can grab them uh, over the next few nights, and then we'll talk about some additional ones you can pick up this week and maybe even look a little ahead a bit. So let me just share my screen here, bring up Stellarium. And I'll put the human, the human faces to the side here. So I'm showing the sky uh, basically right now. I'll bring it into the evening sky here. So these, the uh, only symbols that I'm showing on the sky are the Messier objects. Obviously there's lots and lots more. The winter Milky Way, if you wanna just get out and explore with your binoculars, starts in the south-southeast, just above our friend Canis Major, the, the big dog, stretches up between Orion's Club and Gemini's feet, and then sneaks up through the circle of Auriga. So here's your, here's the Z, this is the zenith, around 8.30 p.m. Uh, tonight or this week. And the um, the actual outer rim of our galaxy, the outer edge where the galaxy should be thinnest and dimmest, actually sits right about here near the horn tip of Taurus, the star Elnath. But actually the, the Milky Way actually is not dimmest there. It's actually dimmest in Perseus, just because of, um, of dust in the plane of the Milky Way. And then if you turn and face kind of north west, you can follow the rest of the Milky Way down through Perseus, down by the W of Cassiopeia, and then down, and this is the top, this is Deneb, this is the top of Cygnus sinking out of sight. So the, the messy objects that you can grab, again, as I, as I recapped, grab your, grab your Orion Nebula while the moon isn't around. Try to get your Casper the Friendly Ghost, which is your Messier 78. And then the Crab Nebula is up here just near the, southern horn tip star of Taurus. The ones that uh, we can grab this week that are new to our Messier minutes are the following. So we've got Messier 41. So now we're looking fairly low in the, in the sky in the south. And what you want to look for up here first is Messier 41, which is sometimes called the little beehive cluster. 
And this one you can see with your naked eye if you've got nice dark skies. Binoculars for sure, and really any size telescope would be fine for the little beehive cluster. Uh, it's also NGC 2287, as you can see from here. Magnitude four and a half, it's relatively bright. In size, it's actually uh, bigger than the full moon. So this, this green circle here represents kind of a low power eyepiece view, maybe one and a half degrees, actually in a, in a six inch Dobsonian telescope, it would look something like that. So it, it would be within the field of view of the telescope. Um, where it's located to find it is you can actually use, let's see, um, the bright star Sirius and just go straight down. Or you can look for kind of this star that's on the, the dog's back and his sort of chest area and go below and between those two stars. But really straight down from Sirius is fine. And uh, it's about 2,300 light years away. And when you're looking at it, you know, try to notice how many bright stars you see, other stars all looking the, like they're the same color, same type, things like that. So pay, pay attention to that kind of thing. Up next, we've got Messier 50. Messier 50 is up above this. Messier 50 is kind of in a, 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 a dark, deadish, um, star-free zone in the sky. But it's a nice, nice open cluster, magnitude 5.9, so it's relatively bright. Um, good for binoculars, obviously, any size telescope, about 3,200 light years away. And it's, um, it's quite bright, but it's a little smaller in size. You can see if I do the um, eyepiece view, it takes up much less space than the little beehive a moment ago. So it's more compact. That makes it a little bit brighter. You can get it from drawing a line from Sirius up through the dog's nose, which is theta, and kind of doubling it. So sort of doubling that Sirius to theta distance, that's a good way of finding it. Um, again, do you see any shape to it? You know, how many, are there any stars that appear different from the other ones, things like that. And, and spoiler alert, there are a few little, little, little things you'll, you'll discover. Um, its nickname is the heart-shaped cluster, so maybe you'll notice the shape of a heart, that kind of thing to look for. All right, now up next, we've got uh, a two, a pair of messy objects that are sitting up here in, this is Puppas, kind of a southerly constellation that isn't as familiar to people um, because it's so low on the horizon. But it's uh, that these two messes, 46 and 47, are, are kind of easy to, to locate the general area because they're just to the east of Sirius, which, is, which you can't miss. So 46, so you can see as I zoom in here that 47 is a brighter one, 46 is the fainter one. And if you want to measure it kind of with your, with your hand, this is represents about 1.3 outstretched fist diameters to the, uh, to the left of Sirius in, in the evening time. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this one is 46. It's a little bit harder to see with naked eyes, but certainly you can pick it up in binoculars. In fact, you'll get them both at once in binoculars. Any size telescope will work. It's almost the size of the full moon. So let me just bring up my eyepiece view here. So you can see it's kind of in between those two previous ones we talked about. Not a lot of overly bright stars in it though. So it tends to be a bit more subdued. Okay, so that's 46. 47 is more of a showpiece. So it's kind of a little bit more of a show off. Let's bring this one into the view here. So as you can see, it's got um, a greater percentage of individual brighter stars to look for. So this one you can pick out with your naked eyes if you've got good sky conditions. Definitely binoculars, definitely any size telescope, doesn't have to be a big one. Almost as big as the full moon. And you, know, you can easily count the number of stars in it. There aren't that many. So that's uh, something you can take, take a look at for that one. Uh, let's see, a couple more. M48. So here we are kind of heading in the same general direction. So M48 is in near the border between uh, Hydra and Monoceros here, the unicorn. And the way I find it is um, it's below and between this medium bright star, C, Hy C Hydra, and kind of on the line on the way to Alpha Monocerotus. So you can kind of, you can find Alpha, and that's just a little bit above those two clusters. So if you've got M46 and M47, look a little bit higher than them for this bright star, medium bright star alpha. 
And then see if you can find this not quite as bright star, C hydra. So that's magnitude 3.9. That's magnitude 3.9. They're the same. And it's about what? I guess a third of the way, you know, closer to C than it is to, uh, to alpha. So for 48, you're going to be looking for, it's not as bright or as condensed as the other ones. So binoculars should see it. A telescope should see it. Your eyes might have trouble picking it out. Um, again, it's relatively, I got the wrong object here. Let me pick up M48, do it again. There we go. So you can see it's kind of sparse and spread out a little bit. And in this one, you can look for patterns in the stars. Now, um, it doesn't have a nickname the way some of the other clusters do. So maybe it hasn't struck people as a particular animal or, or design. So let, let you uh, come to your own conclusions on that. And the last one is M93. And M93 is down here. Kind of These two are kind of to the left of Sirius. And M93 is kind of to the left of Wesson, the dog's um, rear end or bottom, if you like. Um, this one, again, is... Not as bright, it's a magnitude 6.2. You can see it's pretty compact, so pretty condensed and concentrated, but it's not very big. So it's kind of a tiny little clump in that same field of view that I've been using. Um, but yeah, any telescope will do for that one. Um, you can use it, you can find it by, you know, kind of scanning your binoculars to the east of Wesson, or if you can pick up the top two stars of Puppas, so Turas, Terrace, and and as Asmidi as Midi is a little double star. So you'll be able to recognize that in your binoculars as the double star. And then you can look, just scan a little bit above that. It's about, let's see, a thumb's width. So just a thumb's width above and to the right a little bit of as Midi. So again, you can take note of the number of stars that you see, and maybe the compare the number of bright ones with the amount of fainter stars and look for any odd little stars or patterns that you might see in it as well. So those are my recommendations for this time up this week. And that's the last of the winter messiers. So we're, we're, ready to, we're ready to jump into springtime on our next session. So I'm just gonna stop my share here. Spring on our next session too, right? Sorry? Our next session will be on the 14th, which is not too far away from the 21st. Am I wrong? Yep. So well, it makes sense. Forget, I doesn't feel like spring already, so. <laughs> yep, um, uh, we had a quick question. Milky Way, can you see it now? Well, I mean, you can always see the Milky Way. We're kind of in it, but <laughs> um, I know what you mean. Can you see it now or is it starting to show from April to October? That was... Um, Quick question. Oh, yeah. So that's a neat question. Um, kind of off topic here a little bit, but I can just quickly show how this works. Let me bring this up. So the Milky Way, let me just put, get away of these symbols here. And I can make the Milky Way brighter here just by turning off the sky. Here we go. Hopefully you can see that a little bit better than you could before. So the, the central core of our Milky Way is most visible in the summertime. And that's below the horizon for, for us from here. So we're seeing the, the outer reaches rather than the inner reaches, but it's still relatively bright. And at this time of the year, so it stretches, as I said, from the south, south, southeast to the northwest. But as the months go by, let me just bring this up to say around midnight here. So once we get to the next month or so, see how the Milky Way is sort of hugging the horizon. And that leaves all the sky overhead um, with less gas and dust above us. And so that's where we're, that's why we call it galaxy season, because we can look past our own home galaxy and into the deep reaches of space. And then that Milky Way, once we get past the uh, spring months, then it starts rising higher in the sky again. So, yeah, we can definitely see it now. And let's just get back to March 1st here. But um, as we get, you know, another month or two, another month or so, um, it'll be dropping towards the horizon. If your sky is dark. So if we don't have any other questions about messy minutes, um, as you know, you can always find all these target lists 
at uh, rasp.ca slash messy minutes or where you find insider's guide to the galaxy on RASP. Um, oh, I think we have one more question. Oh, just a thank you for explaining. Um, and we'll, we'll dive into spring targets next week. But for now, we are going to hand the floor over to Jody and Isaac. Um, I'll let you take it away. Great, thank you. Um, so I, a couple things I, I thought maybe, um, I know Isaac's gonna be sharing again um, this afternoon. Uh, when you talked about the Crab Nebula, I just wanted to share a little um, experience that I had with that. It, um, so let me just pull up these pictures. So, and part of why I want to talk about this as well is it, you know, one of the reasons we talked about this last time with the um, kind of our hope with this resource that we've been building is to demonstrate to people and to combat these stereotypes that are out there that indigenous knowledge systems and um, and the people are very, it's brilliant. And it's actually been around a heck of a lot longer than Western science, which is the new baby on the block. But um, here is, uh, this is part of this collaboration and as you can see, I'm here uh, in this picture. This is out at Chaco Canyon, um, out at the Navajo Nation. And I was, I'm with my friend Dana, who you can't see in this picture, um, who's Dene from Navajo Nation, and she's part of our collaboration as well. And this is uh, Hohepa, who's uh, Maori, also part of our collaboration. And we spent, we went out to her um, place there, and we went on this incredible hike out at Chaco Canyon. And we went, and so, um, okay, how do I describe this? So imagine you're, this is actually not on the side of a cliff. So this is, you have to like go underneath it. So it's almost like a shelf that sticks out. And um, this is actually a recording of when that supernova took place uh, back in, I think they say 1054. So, you know, a good thousand years ago. And this was documented at this site. And so um, really significant. And I'm probably gonna ask Isaac to talk a little bit about perhaps um, some of these pictographs. Um, but here we are, this is Dana here. Now we're looking, so the, the pictograph site is behind us and we're looking out and we have our, you know, the little star apps that you have on your phones. And we held it up to this part of the sky and sure enough, there's the Crab Nebula. So it was just a really cool experience to be like, you know, we hear these stories. We went on this big trek out there to see this really um, important spot um, that was documented. And, you know, this whole area, this uh, Chaco Canyon area is like the, um, oh, there's the Crab Nebula. Uh, and this isn't, sorry, I forgot the order of pictures here, but this is actually on the way out to Chaco Canyon. And this is a very important formation um, that actually tracks not just the um, solar cycles that are happening, but also the lunar cycles, which is really amazing because that's not an easy feat to uh, keep track of, right? Like the equinoxes and the um, solstice happen every year, but the lunar cycle, that's over an 18 year period. So that's a long time to be observing. And so when we think about science or math or any of these subjects, like this is, an, uh, this is about a consistent and constant observation of things that are happening in this case in the night sky. Um, and then to be able to understand those cycles and um, understand what that means for us here on the ground. So that's, you know, pretty amazing. Um, that's, this is this, uh, lunar cycle that I just mentioned and the swirls, and this is what I wanna get Isaac to talk about as well, cause um, there's much more to it than this, but these swirls are exactly like, there's um, nine and a half rounds. And so if you um, put those together, that actually creates that 18 years. So the fact that, you know, a pictograph that is so precise on these measurements 
you know, that's pretty phenomenal. And this is like a long time ago. Um, so again, this was just a showing of like the dwellings um, and the structures, everything was aligned with um, the night sky and the significance of what's happening in the, in the night sky. Um, so maybe I'll turn it over to Isaac to just talk a little bit about, um, I think I thought I had another, no, nope. sorry, this is from another presentation. Um, but I don't know, Isaac, do you wanna talk about um, maybe that spiral and the significance of it? Or um, I know we wanted to talk a little bit about, Chris, you had mentioned about moonshine. So we'll talk about the moon certainly. Um, and I do wanna to touch base on the Milky Way cause like Isaac could talk about that for I'm sure like five hours. <laughs> so I'm gonna Hi, uh, stop sharing here. And so you can see Isaac, wherever my stop sharing is. There we go. So the, um, thank you so much for sharing all of that information. That was really, really cool. Um, is there a way to spotlight me somehow? So I'm just seeing like little tiny images. There we go. Great. Thank you. Um, so I definitely <laughs> want to thank everybody for tuning in. And it's just a great honor to be here. I really love the, uh, the information in the beginning. It's, it's just so fascinating to, to just look at that vast amount of of everything that is out there it's just mind-boggling it really is um and also for jody for showing those those pictographs in my language we call them mustn't it be a ganan? and the literal translation means uh pictures that are that are drawn and that spiral has such a fascinating and incredible story and they say that the spiral acts as a doorway or as a a way in and oftentimes when i've you know i've been to hundreds of pictograph sites i've you know spoken to you know hundreds of elders about spirals and different symbolisms and they keep coming back with the same answer which is that the spiral itself is a doorway into information it's a doorway into knowledge. It's a doorway into seeking medicine. It's a doorway into trying to end a famine. It's the doorway into trying to end a war. It's a doorway into trying to end disease. <clears throat> and these spirals are connected celestially often. And they believe that this kind of actually links to the moon, actually, um, Jody. So we'll just go from the spiral right to the moon and so they believe that on the moon there is a very special place and they call that doshkapgak which literally means that there is a crack in the moon and oftentimes uh, our people were able to travel into the rock and then from inside the rock there were spirits that would take them to the moon. And once they were at the moon, they were, they were guided into that crack. Now inside of that crack, there is uh, a people that live there inside this crack. And of course, in this amazing cave that's, that's on the moon, this family would, would teach them uh, the remedies that they're seeking. And of course, for the Anishinaabek people, a lot of our ceremonies come from there. So we believe, for example, the sweat lodge comes from there. Um, we, we believe that so many of our ceremonies, our adoption, our naming ceremonies, our uh, you know, wiping of tears ceremonies, our, you know, all of the, the seven major ceremonies of life actually come from Donshkopgak and that with it comes a, a, a series of teachings and we have uh, what what we call the, the great teachings which is you know bravery and humility and strength and respect and love and you know all of those things come from there too and so there's there is a very strong connection 
with the spiral and and the moon and they say that how they would get in is they would put their hand on it and of course once they put their hand on it they would enter into that rock and they would spiral to that other place that where, where they come from and my great great grandfather um, was the last one in my family that went there and he said that uh, the story goes is that he went up there uh, th through such a practice and once he got inside uh, Dashkapkak once he got inside that that cave in the moon he was greeted by the family and that family of star people or celestial beings took him and they made him a nest like a bird's nest and they, they sat him down and he had to watch the earth and that as he was watching the earth that he would be able to see what was going to happen in the future and when he came and when he came back he they gave him a rock and it was a lunar of course it was a lunar rock and it was buried with him but he what he said was that the earth is going through great changes and that the natural laws on earth are not being respected and that he foreseen great war famine and disease and that the animals were, were going to call upon um the spirits in the sky to help uh cleanse the earth and that the animals were going to be under great attack and that that's what he's seen or that's what that's what he was shown and so when he, he was brought back down and he found himself inside this this rock and uh he the the people inside the rock they called them the mimigwesiwak back on earth he was he was released from that rock and they told him always tell the people what what you've seen and he did the message still exists today it, it was passed down from generation to generation on that the natural laws are not being respected and that's what the the star people uh we call we call them anung anung is what we call them and and the Anangog is a very, we believe that the stars themselves are, are very spiritual beings too. And so, you know, his message was that we have to take care of the earth and that the stars teach us how to do that and that he foreseen great destruction on the earth, which now we know is, is true. What, what he saw was true. You know, there's wars, there's famine, there's sicknesses, there's all sorts of, you know, things happening but he also gave a message of hope that when we make our offerings to the stars when we make our offerings to the umbilical cords that are attached to the quayuk to the women that those umbilical cords are attached to the moon that there's a spiritual umbilical cord that's attached to every woman that's directly uh, linked to the moon. And that when we feast those, those cords, that the more and more that we nourish them and we feast them and give them strength, the more and more knowledge will, will get back through those cords and that the knowledge will come through those umbilical cords through our women and they'll, teach, they'll give us those teachings on how to live here on earth because we forgot how to live here. And so he went around for 35 years, um, you know, talking about these sorts of things until his, uh, his final stand or his final, um, he decided to go to war after that. Um, he went to fight the, uh, the British. Um, but that was his message. And uh, they believe that... Uh, there's something that's called the the first the original moon and it's in da da nebegesis is what it's called and it's during that time when people will try to enter dashkapkak 
So it's when there's, it's a new moon, but you can see the moon. And that little slice, that little crescent moon happens. That's when people will attempt to go inside there to gather knowledge. Historically, that's what they've, they've always done. They believe that in the crescent moon, during a new moon, when the moon starts, when the moon just starts, that that's, that's when you're, you're, you go for that knowledge, especially when you can see it. Because that's, um, because then you'll, you'll be guided to Dashkopkak. And it's very difficult to get in there any other time. And so this is a very uh, ceremonial time for for medicine men and, and others to try and, and get in there to receive that knowledge. And, you know, a lot of people will believe that um, it's really hard to believe that sort of thing. It's hard to, it's hard to believe that, that those sorts of things actually really exist. And at the same time, the teachings of them are really beautiful. The moon and the family or the spirits that live there keep reminding us and keep teaching us that we have to live with earth in a correct way, in a way that's compatible with their original instructions as Anishinaabek people. And that's something that's hard to do. So despite the fact that, um, you know, there's two different ideations of what the stars are, um, you know, I think all of it says the same thing. It's a reflection of our own selves. It's a reflection of who we are, what we believe. And it brings us into the magic. You cannot look at the night sky and not feel like you're somehow connect connected to something so far greater than ourselves. And it doesn't matter if we're an atheist or we're a traditionalist or a Christian or whatever. Um, you can't help but feel this massive connection to everything and that there's such a mystery that cannot be explained. And that's where I think these stories about my grandfather, that's where they live, is in that part that's unexplained. And so, you know, there's lots of talk about the moon and all of the gifts that came from the moon, especially this type of a moon. You know, many years ago, there was a, a young lad that was put out to fast on a vision quest at, during such a moon. And of course, he was brought up to Dashkopkak on the moon. And in front of him sat, you know, seven sacred elders and these were celestial beings. And each of them had a clay pot in front of them. Each clay pot had a teaching and a ceremony. And, you know, for us, that's the basis of our, of our spirituality comes from, from those clay pots or those teachings that come from those clay pots. And the, those ceremonies and those teachings were brought down to us through the umbilical cords of our women and there's seven sacred knots on these cords that um, that hold those ceremonies intact so that they'll always be there and that as as we go through those knots that we that's where we learn and understand about those ceremonies did we get intertwined with them and then we move on to the next knot or the next ceremony or the next set of knowledge. And these are old teachings that the old people used to talk about. And they believe that the, the, the star beings uh, were going to come down and that the people from Dashkopkak were going to come down to the earth at some point. And they were going to teach the people how to live again during a time of great war and suffering. And this is a very common uh, prophecy or Anwegichige when they call it with our tribe that the, the people will, the star people will come down and will actually take Anishinaabe up into the sky 
and we'll leave some down here. And the ones that are being brought up will be educated uh, how to, so that they're taught how to live here again. And that the world will become beautiful again because of this knowledge that will be, will be learned you know, so I think that there's a lot of unlearning that we have to do, I think, sometimes, <laughs> you know, to, to figure out what's the right thing. And so certainly the moon and stars carry, um, you know, a beautiful bundle of information and carry such a beautiful bundle of, of hope, you know, during a, during a very difficult time in, in humanity, during a, vi a very difficult time you know, for our animals and for our plants and, you know, living things, the, the creepy, creepy crawlers and the birds, you know, so when life is really tough right now for everything, it's comforting to know that the sky is there. It's comforting to know that those teachings are there. It's comforting to know that, that somehow, some way that, you know, there's something out there that is you know, they're on our team, <laughs> you know, they're on our team and, you know, they're here to help. And so in pictography, you, you'll always see, you know, people reaching for the sky or reaching for the ground. So when you look at pictographs, you'll see people reaching up like this all the time. Why they're doing that is because they're reaching to the sky to, to get knowledge. They're reaching up to the stars to try to bring down knowledge so that that'll help them with their path here on earth to help them get on the original path that holds the, the correct instructions on how to live here. And so for thousands and thousands of years, people have been going to these celestial sites to gain that knowledge, to remind themselves that we have to follow a certain path. And that that path will lead to sustainability and, you know, for, for ecological justice for the next generations. And so this pictograph is the most common pictograph there is in pictography anywhere in the world. And again, it's, it's the symbol of, of reaching up, you know, and there's songs you know, that go with this, you know, there's different songs that, that talk about these sorts of things and what they're doing. And I actually have a drum right here. So I want to sing you a verse. Um, and this song is a song about that. It's about, you know, gaining that knowledge and, you know, the knowledge becomes a part of us. It becomes a part of our body, our physical body, but also it, it's a part of our spirit too. So this is a song that talks about, you know, reaching up and getting that knowledge. Why? Be thank you it, but but the drum was just right there so again the song That's is about great. reaching up miigwech the song is about reaching up into the sky 
and asking that knowledge to come down into us and so that we could we could pick that up as we walk in this life and you know i think that's so relevant today and i think you know when i first jumped on here today um you know, I was really busy. I, I'm a busy guy. I had lots of things to do. I jumped on here and all of a sudden I seen this picture of the sky and, and I see like, you know, all these stars, clusters and stuff. And it's just like I completely deflated all of the stress from work. And I can see everybody reaching up and it's so beautiful to see. So I don't want to take up too much time and space, but, you know, keep doing what you're doing just exactly what you're doing don't change anything you know keep being stargazers keep believing keep searching and you know keep just like what the instructor always says like what do you see in this because what you see can be great medicine for for a lot of people so with that i want to thank you for that your time and for your energy and i know jody has some stuff that she has to go through. So we're going to give Jody that time and space, but me, Gwich, thank you so much. Thank you. A pleasure. Yeah. yeah you know, thank hope, you so much. hope people, you know, have your heart and your mind open when you're, when you're gazing at the sky and, and receive the messages because of the patterns, the messages, what does it, what does it say to you? Things like that. So that's amazing. Thank you. And isn't it fascinating? Like as humans, we're, our brains are like, um, we're like pattern seekers. We are programmed to look for patterns and to, and to make sense of patterns and recognize those things. And, um, I think hopefully the people who are listening now, cause this is, it's really hard to try and explain, um, without having Isaac for sure, how, um, it's one thing to look at the night sky but it's a whole other to really understand this deep connection. And I, you know, I hope like um, listening to that and um, people are starting to kind of see the significance of it. And, you know, I mentioned before, like one of the uh, goals we have is to try and break down these stereotypes because unfortunately for many, many, many years in like through, um, you know, media or whatever like this depiction that has you know around um indigenous people and this narrative that's been constructed over time as being like very simplistic and you know frolicking in the woods and simple and leathers and feathers and like we're trying to say um we are way much more than that um, and have really amazing things to offer. And so um, anyway, let me just pop back over to the resource because that's where I come in to show how we've created some of these connections. And then maybe um, we'll come back to Isaac if he's okay with this because there's also a connection between the moon and the Milky Way um, with what he was saying. And one of my, and of course that, um, you know, we'll often say um, stories but I want to uh, remind people that when we say story, we're not saying story in the sense of um, myths, legends, lore, and, you know, things that are made up. So when we say story, it's more like knowledge transference, historical accounts, maybe it's scientific accounts or geographic information. So I just want to really remind people of that because that's another <laughs> um stereotype that we're trying to break through because when we if otherwise when we think of it in that way if we say story and then our, our minds go to myths and legends then it it reinforces that idea that these knowledge systems are um you know not on no, don't have the same weight as we give to things like quantum physics right so uh okay so let me go back over to the resource so i just want to point out and maybe um, Chris or Samit, that one of you can put in the chat box the website again, lessonsfromearthandbeyond.ca. Um, so we when do that. Awesome. So that's so on this site. Actually, maybe what I'll do just to make it 
so everyone knows how I got here. So let's start from the front page, Lessons from Earth and Beyond. And I go over here and I'm going to go to Lessons from Beyond, because as you can imagine, that's about the sky. <laughs> um, and down here, there's a section called Grandmother Moon. Um, I will say it's not finished, this, er this section of the resource, but um, this is where we do have some pieces from our collaborators and contributors. Um, so we have this beautiful narration, uh, Ganyagahaga, which is Mohawk, um, telling of the, how the moon came to be. Um, then we have our NASA partner uh, giving this the Western uh, story of how the moon came to be. And similar to what we shared at the last session, like this is about looking for how um, all of these different knowledge systems are really telling that same fundamental idea or understanding. Um, and then here is a little bit of, uh, Isaac gifted you so much beautiful information today. A little piece of that is in here in this animation that we did. And then we have this one here uh, with Wilford Buck. Um, and again, another, another perspective, but, um, they're all, but again, it's all like pieces of the puzzle. And that thread of all of these, um, all of these narratives all basically say that same piece around our connection and our roles and responsibilities. So if it's okay with Isaac, because when we when you were talking there about um, uh, the moon and going into that special place to retrieve that information. And uh, it made me think about how, um, and you were talking about how um, some of the Anishinaabe are brought up to be given that information. So therefore it reminded me of that story of how the Milky Way came to be. And not to that you, not to ask you to tell that entire story, but if you wanna just talk about, cause I mean, it's my favorite, but if you want to talk a little bit about the Milky Way, because it was mentioned um, at the beginning of the talk today. Yeah, for sure. So the Milky Way, we call that Jibai Mikan, which means the path of souls. And for the Ojibwe people, the Anishinaabe people, we believe that we come from a place from in the stars and that we come down here to earth. We have a, an earthly existence or we have this this beautiful experience here on earth and then we're to go back up through the milky way travel across and then go back to where we originally come from and so the milky way is pretty important to us because that's how we we get back home after this is all said and done here so if that wasn't there then we're we're kind of in trouble um so there's a lot of um, constellations in the Milky Way that describe the journey going back to our original homelands. And the Milky Way was, was a gift from Nanabuju, who was, of course, one of the creators of the earth and the land as we know it today. And the Milky Way was actually... Um, came about through this really crazy story of and these these you know events that took place a long time ago. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of that. Um, the entire story can take hours to take um, to tell. So obviously I, I can't do that, but I'm going to give you like a really short version of the story. So they believed a long time ago that. There was two women, two young ladies that were on the moon. And of course, uh, they lived in Doshkopkok. They were from there. And one of them found a, a magunos, a bone. And of course, they got into a fight. And over this bone, it sounds silly, but I actually, I just actually happened to have that bone right here. Oh, wow. <laughs> It's like everything's like an arm, arm's reach for me for some reason. This here is the Magos. It's a bone all 
that's found in the front leg of a moose. And it's used for making baskets. It's used for canoe building. It's a very useful tool. And many years ago, when they, when these, when that young lady found this on the moon, she put it in her hair to, to hold her bun up. And her sister got jealous over time and wanted to have one. And so she started to dig around the moon looking for one too. And she couldn't find one. And that's how the craters of the moon uh, became to be there because that was her digging, trying to find one of these. Finally, she had enough and she decided to fight her sister for that, for, for this bone. And her sister threw her off the moon. And when she landed here on earth, she fell into a big pile of lake, <laughs> a big pile of lake. And when she um, hit the water, her medicine bag of all her star medicine, it, it opened up and all of that star medicine went to the bottom of the lake. And it was dark down there. So she's trying to find her medicine, her star medicine to put back in her bag. But it, it, it was too dark. All of it sunk and she couldn't find anything. And so an old bear, I actually happen to have an old bear right here. An old bear. Like this. You know, came to her. Swing. And said, you better get out of there. There's something, there's monsters, there's serpents down there. They're going to eat you. You better get up here. She says, what about my star medicine? Don't worry about it. I'm a bear. I know all the medicines of the earth, all the roots and shrubs. I spend many moons in the ground studying these things. Just come up here and I'll, I'll help you fix your medicine bag. I'll fill it, help you fill it up with medicine. So she swam to the top and, you know, she ended up falling in love with the bear. She ended up getting her medicine bag filled up. You know, they had a child, um, you know, they raised up the child. The child married the West Wind, who in turn had four children. And she died, she died giving birth to the last child. And one of the child was, was called Nanabuju. And one of the child was name was uh, Jipayabus. And so, you know, as Nanabuju got older, he got into a fight with the serpents and they flooded the earth. And, the, you know, the whole earth was flooded. And so Nanabuju got a whole bunch of animals to go down and bring up, try to bring up earth so that he could blow this earth and make land again. Nanabuju was like, like Maui off Moanda. Like shapeshifter, like very powerful being, you know, like uh, trickster. Um, sometimes just a regular pain, and other times just absolutely incredible. Um, and so finally, Muskrat brought him the dirt, and he he blew the dirt, and made land as we know it today. And but there is one animal, the Mekonok, the turtle, that was jealous because it wasn't asked specifically to do a certain job when they're creating the, the world, the, the land as we know it. And so Turtle went pouting in the bottom of the lake. And so Nanabuju, you know, called Turtle to, to come up and said, come up here, I want to speak to you. Why are you pouting down there? And Turtle came up and Nanabuju grabbed an arrow and shot that turtle, but not to kill it, but just to scare it. And that turtle's tail flicked up in the like this. And all that mud, it splattered all the way across the sky in a line. And it created the Milky Way. Because that turtle was sitting in that pile of medicine, that star medicine, that star woman had dropped there, you know, so many generations before. And so that's our creation story for the Milky Way. And then Nanabuju got his brother Jibayabus, to be the guardian or to be the, the chaperone for people as they go through that Milky Way back to where they come from. And so that's like the shortest version of the Milky Way that I've ever given. Um, 
but that's that's our our creation story for it. And so we feast Jibayabus, the helper, the one that helps us across the sky. And we nourish Jibayabus in the winter time. And you know, we ask that that our, our our people's journeys are quick and that they're light and that they don't face any obstacles. And so that's that's kind of our teaching about it. And so uh, we really, really believe that the Milky Way is something special. And a lot of the old people would look at it and they'd be able to predict the future by how it was acting and how, how it was, some things would be irregular. That's not, that's things not supposed to be there or pictures would move around and they were able to say, oh, something's not right or something is absolutely fantastic. And so they were able to really tell the future by looking at these things and that the, the sky world is a reflection of our past, our present and our future. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. So thank you for mu so much for letting, letting me bring out the bear and the, the bone. <laughs> But thank you. you just happy to be there. That's amazing. <laughs> I um, the other thing too is um um the idea of like again as an example of Western science just kind of being new on the scene is that the understand so this understanding of the Milky Way that's been you know understood for thousands of years. There's also um, a story or a telling about a very significant Thunderbird nest, which is actually the center, which is actually, um, what is it? Sagittarius A, the black hole. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole telling around that, that is in relation to knowing about this black hole before science and its instruments were able to detect that. So it's, you know, it's just incredible. Um, I put in the link as well. Um, just in case people are interested. So Isaac does have a book out. He's an author too. So if you're interested. What don't you do, Isaac? I know, right? And wait, Isaac, what section is this book under? Because this is like, this is a new thing. It's now under the- So I made, I made sure that it was under uh, nonfiction. And uh, I said, this is a history of our people and it should be under nonfiction. And- uh, a lot of the bookstores thought that was great. Um, this really is a, a book about celestial stuff. Almost all of it has to do with celestial things. And so it's, uh, you know, it gives, and it's in the language too. So if there's anybody that's Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe this is a good language resource too as well. Um, and book two is almost done. Ooh. And so the publishers are just waiting for my cover art. And awesome. again, there's a lot of celestial stories in there. Um, so, but yeah, by all means, uh, get it. Yeah, that link is in there. And just to kind of go back to over back to the resource to show you where you can um, find if you want to hear more about what Isaac just shared. So again, here we are back at the main lessons from beyond index page. Um, so under here, we come from the stars in this section. And maybe what I'll do, actually, I'll play a little snippet so you can see or hear or watch <laughs> um, what's in here. So I'm just going to scroll down. So in this little section here, we call it an online classroom. So it is a Google uh, thing. Anyway, so he talks about these things. And also in here are links to some Maori stories of creation as well. Um, but let me just get to this part, uh, so you can see. Okay, so you click on here. So here's where, let me put it up in big for you, and I'll just play a little snippet for you. People were given certain instructions on how to live here on Earth. They believe that our people come from the stars and that we were lowered down here. And that's actually what 
our word for Anishinaabe, what it means, being lowered down. I remember years ago as a child, I used to hear the old people tell me stories about the stars. A long time ago, there was two young ladies that were playing on the moon, and they were having fun playing around in the dirt. Anyway, so he goes on to talk about that story that you just got a very abbreviated version of. So if you want to hear it, um, you know, in its entirety, you can go there. Um, so Don't go now. Wait till after, to, after the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, I just wanted to show you that part where it connects in. And maybe is there um, any questions that people have? questions Let's we see. have a lot of thank yous in the chat for sharing your story isaac um we really appreciate you being here but if you have any questions you can put them in the chat now i was i was i don't know if we have time today but i i really enjoyed isaac's story about curly tail and i don't know if we have time to touch on that but is are we getting into that time of the year where we can <laughs> snow is still on the ground no, it's too early. You're still on the ground outside me. <laughs> yeah. Or whatever or would you make, or whatever it's, it's allowed. Yeah. Yeah, we have someone asking. That's an Isaac maker, question. But... Yeah. Maybe you could maybe you could share a little bit about the the protocols around sharing stories too. So yeah, that would, I think a lot of people have questions about sharing the knowledge and what's the right way to approach it. Things like that. We had some last questions. From last time, especially because the know, term many, not using the term Star Lore has been something that we've all really learned through you guys recently. So I appreciate that. You know, I always say that these stories are not my own stories, but these are my grandparents' stories, and that mm -hmm. you know, it's it's an honor to be able to carry these stories on their behalf, even though they're not here anymore. You know, I carry these stories for them, and. You know, I, I'm very blessed and honored to be able to carry that, that sacred bundle on their behalf for the next generation. And so some of the, the protocols, um, I don't know if they call them protocols. I guess there's just, there's an ethic that goes with these stories. You know, so I had to, to make offerings and I had to fast um, at these celestial sites or these, these sacred sites to be able to earn the right to be able to tell these stories. And I had to be very disciplined in learning them and not to forget details. And so once they felt that I was, these stories were, you know, could be trusted with me, that I would, I would you know, deliver them in a sacred way, in a good way, then they were, they were passed down to me. And again, I had to give offerings. I had to uh, make these payments of gifts and presents you know, to be able to do so. And uh, they felt that when you gift, when you make an offering, you know, the medicine we seek is often in the offerings that we give. And so, you know, these things never came uh, just freely, but we had to, to really be disciplined and pray and also fast to acquire this knowledge. And that's, that's, we were, were earned a right to be able to tell these stories like that. And oftentimes during the stories themselves, obviously I can't do it on Zoom, but normally I'd have my bundle out, I'd have my sacred items out, and I'd be feasting the different, the spirits and the different people that I'm talking about in the stories. And I'd offer that food in, into the forest or the fire afterwards because we invited them down to come and help us and to share their knowledge with us. Um, and so these are some of the things that we do um, as we tell all these stories. And, and again, in the, in the English language, it doesn't give us justice. They're called Atsukanan, which means there's their spiritual experiences that happened. And that's, that's what they're really called. They're not called stories. The Bijamoan means story in my language. These are not the Bijamoanan. These are Atsukanan. These are spiritual 
um, events that took place. And so for us, this is our history. This is our, our, you know, this is our encyclopedia of who we are is the, the stars. Um, yeah, there's lots of stories. Um, the winter maker, fascinating story. Um, you know, some of those, it's just, there's a big, so there's a huge mass of celestial story that's just, it's filled with incredible stuff and everything's all connected. And there's, there's this big tale that's told and it'd be just, I mean, I, I rarely get to do it. The last time I did that was in uh, Minnesota <clears throat> when they invited me down for four days. And for four days from morning till night, I told star stories. And it was, uh, it was pretty cool. And they want me back for part two. Um, but again, uh, you know, and it was done in a very ceremonial way. So for, for us, ceremony and belief and offerings all go hand in hand with these, with these sacred teachings yeah but but again thanks um one of these days we just need more time in real life to get together and just shoot the bull you know but anyway thank you so much yeah. um thank you we have a couple questions um one was saying if you're comfortable are these uh traditional knowledge journeys to the crack in the moon um are they being undertaken or will they ever be undertaken again by knowledge keepers or is this still is more happened in the past if you're comfortable talking about this yeah they they certainly believe that our people are going to be going on these journeys um and i believe some already have and and it's to try and get knowledge to save the earth and to to know to bring back knowledge on how to survive um whatever's coming and so yes absolutely this is a very real thing and there's a longer story of of when 10 medicine men are going to go to fast and you know all this stuff but i really don't have time to tell you that but it's a fascinating story um but most definitely um people that have those gifts um they're they're on it <laughs> Well, a good question. Glad here. We could use knowledge about how to live more harmoniously on the earth. I think everybody can. So, there was a question um, around the connection between the women and the moon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So we we believe that as you know, as a dad. Um, I was at the birth of my daughter and it was the most extraordinary, incredible ceremony of life that I've ever seen. Um, you know, seeing the baby's head come out, you know, my daughter taking her first breath and I held her and then all of a sudden she, she screamed and her breath went into my mouth and I just happened, I just happened to go, <gasps> I was so uh in shock and i and i breathed in her first breath and her first breath went into my my heart it went into my lungs too and at that moment i realized that there's something absolutely extraordinary and powerful and mysterious about a woman <laughs> it's like it's like the mystery of the universe in a lot of ways you know i'll never understand it but my That's grandmother true. who helped, it's true. Jody had 17 children or something. It's true. Um, but my grandmother did have 16 children though. And she often talked about um, this powerful connection that the women have as water carriers to the moon and that they have a spiritual umbilical cord that's connected. And that as the moon fades away and comes back and fills up with water, and you know creates the tides and the energy and the flows and the ebbs and all these things that happen that women hold such a powerful responsibility and that um that they're sacred and that that we have to treat them as so 
and that they they are um, connected uh, deeply to the moon, and that the moon is their great. They call it their grandmother, and so there is a, a real deep connection, and it's. I, I can't say much because it's not my place to say. Um, you know, it would be a grandmother's place to talk about these things. Even though I heard them, it's still not appropriate for me to talk about them because it's it's not my it's not my place. You know, but definitely there's a very strong, very powerful connection. And the closest thing that I can explain about the power of that was experiencing my daughter's first first breath. It was just extraordinary, incredible. I am even today. I I'm I'm in shock at what happened. Like the whole thing is just, it is deeply spiritual and deeply a mystery to me, um, like the stars. But thank you very much for that question. Um, so yes, there's many variations of Sky Woman, and there's many stories of Sky Woman, and so just like I was saying before, it's like. It's like you take this puzzle and you have all this knowledge and, you know, and you just kind of, everybody has a piece. And when you put it all together, it kind of shows the big picture of things. And so in our culture, we're very tolerant and we're very uh, accepting to other ways of believing and knowing because we understand that that's all part of the bigger picture. And so, you know, I never ever want to diminish Western science because that's part of the puzzle. That's part of the great mystery that we're all trying to, to learn and benefit from. We are the beneficiaries of each other's knowledge because collectively it tells the bigger picture. Um, so again, that's another reason why I'm so happy to be here. Um, how is Isaac school fund me for running water for the house project coming along? Um, <laughs> Well, it's coming along. I mean, uh, I'm I'm about, you know, out of the twenty thousand, I've raised nine thousand, which is pretty good. I feel good that I'm going to have running share. water. Are you able to share? The, oh, perfect! Thanks, Jody. <laughs> yeah. So historically, First Nations don't have running water <laughs> because of the. There's a whole bunch of reasons, and I'm not going to get into them. Um, but there's, you know, there's thousands and thousands of indigenous people without in clean running water there's you know still you know over a hundred communities without clean drinking water and there seems to be no um light at the end of the tunnel and so i've just decided i'm just going to do a gofundme why am i waiting for the government you know and i'm going to just work 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 and and just get this done um, the demographics for Indigenous people are a little bit different. And so, especially where I come from, um, it's very difficult to be plugged into the economic fabric. Um, there is a certain um, demographic that is, doesn't fit in very well where I come from, and I happen to be, be part of that demographic. So I, I have to really I do what I can to make sure that we have clean running water. Um, you know, racism is, has been a constant uh, pressure, but I see things changing. And I also see hope because I, right now I'm seeing more people working together to make each other's lives better than I've ever seen before. And it's forums like this that create that doorway, that build bridges, that, you know, you know people are probably going to watch us and say, you know what, that Indian was pretty cool. That Indian was pretty cool, you know, and I'm not going to think about the same way. And then, of course, I'm going to be like looking at at this saying, you know what? That instructor guy was really awesome, you know, like, you know, I, I can't I can't be judging instructor guy, you know, because he's really, really cool, you know. And so that's what this is really to me. This is an, an important part of why we developed this resource and decided to come on was we are all children of the stars. We're all fascinated. We're all connected, like, in the most profound way that it's unescapable. And, you know, it's, it's and that's the kind of world I want my, my kid to live in. 
where everybody gets along, everybody's cool, you know, and and everybody has clean drinking water. <laughs> you know, so my daughter never experienced clean clean drinking water. Like she it was it was the water was deadly poisonous. You couldn't drink it. You know, but I believe with the help of community and and you know those types of things, we are going to uh, get it. Um, Good. Your shirt, your shirt is pretty cool. Yes, it's. Uh, we are here. It's time. Believe, rise strong. So that's one of my art pieces, um, and it's just basically a sexy alien chick um, <laughs> that is, you know, horribly stereotyped. But I love her. And she's she's here to help us. Inspired oh, by Biff Naked, by the way. I, I hope everybody, <laughs> you know, pays a visit to the website and and learns from the knowledge there, sips from the sips from the fire hose of information. And if anybody's inspired by anything in particular and want Jody and Isaac to return, you know, down the road a piece. Send Samantha and I, you know, a note. Let us know what intrigued you, what you liked, what you want to hear more about, and then we can we can we can forward those um, requests directly to Isaac and Jody and get them to come back. I also threw in there for people. Um, Isaac has a new website, so there's some really awesome things on there, and his artwork is on there. Um, and yeah, so you can check that out. And I really want to, um, if you can, I'm going to put a plug in for this is, he, you know, Isaac mentioned about offerings and I know we're doing this virtually and it's, it is what it is, but mm. like when, if we were to go and sit with somebody like Isaac, we would bring gifts. Um, we would, we would, there would be an exchange of something. So I'm just going to throw out the suggestion. A lovely gift would be that uh, to make a donation to the GoFundMe, um, if you can, um, for the clean water as a, yeah. you know, part of that um, reciprocity, if you can. Very meaningful, very meaningful offering for sure. Great idea. So I think we're, that's we're pretty much coming up to time. I, I noticed that there was another question separate from what we were talking about. I don't know if you want to finish with that or um, do you want Isaac to finish with some words? I well, think what we can do is, um, Chris, I was gonna say, can open it up to any last questions for Jody and Isaac. And then if you guys can sign off would be best. What do you think, Chris? Or yeah, let's just let remind folks, we'll be back in two weeks. We're going to do a special March break edition of Insider's Guide, where we're going to be live from the David Dunlap Observatory. So we'll walk around the, the telescope, the dome, go inside the Amin building, share some stories and some history. So hopefully people can tune into that. But other than that, I'm happy to uh, open the floor to anybody who has any parting thoughts or comments or questions or appreciations. Mm -hmm. What do we have here? I would like to say that I know we talked about connecting and learning and I feel like I have so much in common with how with Isaac and everyone Jody here even more after hearing you speak like I grew up with my dad always telling me that we all don't know the full picture of life we just kind of everybody knows a little bit of it and we have to put it together and that seems to exactly what Isaac was describing and from what I've heard back from other people we've had similar um, responses about just kind of opening up our eyes and to things we are so familiar with but still learning new things about it so I just I thoroughly want to thank you guys for coming on I really appreciated it and I'm sure all of our viewers do as well yes thank you so much yeah, in, in, in regards to the question about Mercury and Venus, this is on tomorrow morning's sky that I'm sharing right now. So Venus, you can't miss. It's going to be there every morning for a couple of months, several months at least. Um, and then pay attention to the lower right of Venus for much fainter Mars. It's about 250 times fainter. 
So once the sky gets starts getting a little bright, Mars will disappear. But they'll they'll be traveling together for the next um, next few weeks, and then Venus is going to start heading back sunward, and Mars is going to be heading sort of the other way. Mercury is on its way out, but Mercury and Saturn are are rising a little bit later, so they're much lower. What's great is that let's see here's this is this is today, and tomorrow they're going to be telescope close to one another, but Please be careful putting pointing a telescope to the eastern sky before sunrise. You've got to turn it away, turn it aside before the sun rises. But but Mercury is on the way out, so it's actually heading down and back towards the sun, while Saturn is going to head up and join Venus and Mars over the next little while. So stay tuned. We'll talk a lot more about the morning sky in our future sessions. That is such a pro tip there, okay? Point your telescope away from the sunrise. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, also, we could do a whole session, I'm sure. Um, there's, you know, <laughs> on the morning star and the evening star, which is to do with Venus. But yeah. anyway, we've come to the end. So I just want to turn it back over to Isaac because um, just to give us some closing words. Yes, please. Uh, so again, I want to thank everybody for, for taking the time. And it was really an honor of mine to be a guest here with Jody, my sister. And, you know, I can't help but think that the stars, you know, there's a pattern of, of respect that they go through. And there's a pattern of, of being able to, to live with each other, you know, cycle after cycle, year after year. And, it's just, and we see that every every year. We see how how this this massive life force just keeps evo- just keeps existing with each other, and it's such a beautiful example of of how we can be, and how we and how we should be. And so when I when I look at that, I you know there's not one story or one legend or one atsukanan as we call it in our language where stars fight each other, where there's disharmony in the sky. And so if that's one thing that I want to take is, is that I, I want to send out special prayers and, and also, you know, good thoughts for all of our children and families that are suffering in war. And, you know, those that might be, that might be hurting because it's, it's really important that we pull together during this time in our history. This is like a time no, of no other. You know, we're in Atsukan now. They're going to be telling this story one day. And I think that kindness and love and respect and humility and, you know, caring for each other is such an important part of this sacred story that we're in now. And the stars, again, you know, they teach us that. And so sometimes when I forget... I just look up and I'm instantly reminded of all of the beautiful things that I can be and that I strive to be. And so I'll leave that with you. And I thank all of you for tuning in and being with us. It's been a great honor. So thank you very much. Miigwech. Rich, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it sounds like you're going to have to come back. (laughs) <laughs> so we'll, we'll talk and we'll see what we can we can do about that it's been wonderful that thank great. you for thank you for joining us thanks for thank having you. us take care have a good Our day pleasure thank you take care bye keep looking up everybody bye.